Well, good morning, everyone. Happy to welcome you back on campus. And those of you who are watching online, thank you for doing that. Thank you for sharing the services as you do. Uh, we are streaming on three different platforms and literally thousands of people uh, tune into these services each weekend. We're hearing so many incredible stories of lives that are being changed. And it's all because of the partnership that we have with you, sharing the services and letting your family and friends know uh, about what God is doing here. We're in a series, as Rob said, called Proof. And we're looking into the Gospel of John at seven uh, instances in the life of Jesus where he performed incredible miracles. And the purpose of the miracles that he performed was to bring people from darkness into light, to cause people who did not place their faith and trust in him because he just didn't know, to bring them to a point, that epiphany, that moment when they knew Jesus is who he says he is, he can do what he says he can do, I'm gonna place my faith and trust in him. And then the reason you have the Gospel of John is to reinforce the faith that we have. It's to give us the assurance as we go through the, the changes and the vicissitudes of life that God's in control, he cannot fail. There's nothing too hard for him. So it's a, it's a great study, this Gospel of John, and I hope the messages will bless you as we look deeper into what God has done and how that affects our lives today. And to understand that, we really need to understand how God made us, how God made us. He made us, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.13, as spirits and souls that inhabit bodies. The body, our bodies are temporal. It's the only part of us, by the way, that is temporal. The spirit and soul are eternal. The Bible says when God breathed into man, the, uh, uh, the nostrils of man, the breath of life, man became a living soul. The idea is eternal. There'll never be a moment when you and I cease to exist. And what determines our destiny is what we believe and who we place our faith and trust in. So again, the Gospel of John says, believe in Jesus. Place your faith and trust in him. It will make the difference in life, and it will make the difference in your eternity. Because God made us as uh, temporal beings, but we are eternal beings. We're going to a better place. We're going to a place one day uh, that uh, is called heaven. And I'm excited, honestly, about that day when we'll be reunited with our loved ones and friends who are there. And I'm as sure that that will happen as the sun will set today. So we have something to look forward to. And so Jesus underscores the significance, the importance of placing our faith and trust in him. And this morning we're going to look at another wonderful miracle that Jesus did in the life of a man who was powerless to help himself. And so if you have a Bible, look with me in John chapter 5. We're going to look at this narrative, just a few verses there. The Bible says in verse 1, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Now they've excavated that area just north of the temple area. I've been there. You actually today can see the pool of Bethesda. And it is, it is exactly as John describes it. It is the pool that is there with five different porches. And so John says, here at the pool of Bethesda, there lay a great multitude of sick people. He describes them as blind and lame and many paralyzed. And note what they're doing. They're waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, this hope of healing that these people had, it was real. And the Bible says this angel would come at a certain time of the year and stir the water. And if those could get in the water at the time of the stirring, they could be healed. So you see how they're around this pool, powerless to help themselves, waiting for a miracle of God to change their life and to change their destiny. And so that's the setting. And the Bible says in verse 5, there was a certain man who had a disease. And this certain man with this disease had this infirmity, note now, 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had been already in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered and said, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, here's the miracle, rise, take up your bed and walk. Here's the faith. Immediately the man was made well. He took up his bed and he walked. 
The first thing I want to underscore and explore a little more is what I'm calling the dilemma this man faced. The dilemma this man faced. He found himself at this place called the Bethesda. It was widely known through the area. They didn't have medical facilities. They didn't have places that you could go if you had these incurable ailments and these problems in your life. So they would gravitate to this pool of Bethesda because the legend had it uh, that the angel would come once a year and stir the waters and that if you could get in the water at the time of the stirring, you could be cured of whatever the ailment that you had. So gathered around that pool, you're surrounded by people who are sick and blind and lame, people with all kinds of ailments, all kinds of problems. And when you study the narrative, there's a paradox that I don't want you to miss. The paradox is the pool of Bethesda is right close to the sheep gate. And the paradox is at the sheep gate within eyesight or earshot of where these people are gathering, there's commerce happening. There's life happening. There are children playing. There's business transactions and there's people talking and visiting and they're, they're living their lives and they're enjoying their life. And within eyesight and earshot of what's going on is the pool of Bethesda. So close to having a life and so close to enjoying life and so close to living life to the full are these people gathered by the pool who are not experiencing what other people are experiencing. They see other people enjoying their life and they they can see other people having great friendships and they see other people being successful, but it's not happening for them. They hear the joy and they hear the sounds of the laughter, but there's no laughter around the pool of Bethesda. There's no joy around the pool of Bethesda. They've gathered there because they're faced with something that is impossible for them to fix. And the sad reality of it is they are allowing the dysfunction of their situation to slowly define them. In fact, there's a problem that you can have when you are challenged with a physical illness that it can begin to affect you psychologically. When what you're going through physically can have a psychological effect on your life. When it isn't long until you are going through a beat down in your life to such a point that it affects your spirit and it isn't long until you despair. That's why the proverb says the spirit of a person will sustain them in their infirmity. Meaning that if I can keep my spirit up, even though my circumstance may be bad, if I can keep my circumstance up, it affects and changes and impacts the way I go through something. Because Jesus had said, remember in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. I talked about the fact you can have a troubled life and an untroubled heart. It's possible to go through a terrible circumstance physically as the people around the pool were going through. It's possible to go through that outwardly and not let it affect you inwardly. Some of the most joyful people I know are some of the people who've gone through some of the deepest valleys had some of the biggest heartache. And yet they seem full of joy and they're at peace with their life and, and, and know they're not satisfied and know they're, they're not uh, really happy with all that they've experienced, but they have a sense of joy because they know God is in control. They know God cannot fail. They know God will not fail. And so they haven't allowed the things that have happened out here to, to get in here. But when you look at the pool of Bethesda and you study that, you see a pathology developed around the pool. They began to gravitate to people who were like them. And unhealthy people tend to attract unhealthy people. And so everybody around the pool was unhealthy. Everybody around the pool had the same problems and and they were finding some comfort within their misery. You see, we tend in our human nature, we tend to colonize what we can't cure. Back in the day, they had leper colonies because they would colonize, they would group people uh, that they could not cure. So everyone had the same problem, and so they found each other. You know that happens emotionally? When people are unhealthy emotionally, they can be attracted to other people who are unhealthy emotionally, and before long, you develop this very unhealthy pathology, this unhealthy dysfunction. I talk to couples from time to time, and they have this mistaken impression that two half people can somehow make a whole person. 
that, yeah, I'm not healthy emotionally or spiritually, or, or, or maybe I'm struggling a little bit in some areas of my life, but if, if I just find the right person, they can fix me. You know, you complete me. Wasn't that the line from Jerry Maguire? There's not, listen, there's not a person on the planet that can complete you. All you're going to do is create some weird dysfunction in a relationship. You're going to bounce from one person to the next because no one can complete. Here's the point. You've got to be healthy in and of yourself. I'm large and in charge of me. Sometimes we have to get to the point where we realize I'm on a porch. <laughs> I found myself on a porch, and not only am I a porch, I've made a bed on the porch. <laughs> I've gotten comfortable being miserable. And I have the power to change my circumstance. God has the power to change my circumstance. But if you're not careful, you can develop a pathology. You can absolutely make yourself comfortable being miserable. He made a bed. <laughs> Let me ask you, what, what platform are you on by the pool? <laughs> have you settled for something less than God's best for your life? You see, I'm in charge. I, 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 if I'm healthy emotionally, if I'm healthy spiritually, then yes, you bring a lot into a relationship. You can have a powerful relationship when two healthy people find each other and are connected in a relationship. But you can't be healthy for someone else. You can't be spiritual for someone else. You can't eat for someone else. It doesn't work that way. You have to come to a place where you realize I'm responsible for me and I'm not going to surrender for less than God's best for my life. I'm not going to settle at a platform next to a pool around a bunch of other dysfunctional people. So I'm just suggesting to you that in our human nature, there's a tendency we have to let what's going on around us affect our spirit and beat us down to where we give up and we just mail it in and we stop trying. And man, when you study the narrative, that's exactly what these people were thinking. Look, if you don't think it will get better, that has a powerful effect on you. If you think this is the best it's going to be, it has a powerful negative effect on you. See, the reality is you and I will, will, will settle on the level we become complacent on. You'll end up with a relationship you settle for. You'll end up with a career you settle for. You'll end up with a life you settle for. <laughs> I'm just saying don't settle. From time to time, we're all going to find ourselves by the pool. It's, it's one thing to get down. Just don't stay down. It's one thing to go through a circumstance, but don't allow the circumstance to define you. Don't let what you're going through today out here get in here. This man faced this dilemma, this dilemma that was impacting his life, that had caused him to kind of mail it in. And notice what happened. The second thought is, he had a decision. There's a decision that he had. He, he came to a crossroads when he encountered Jesus. And can I tell you, there's a beautiful part in the story, and the part of the story that's so beautiful is the fact Jesus knew where he was, and he knew what he was going through. And can I stay, stop long enough to say, he knows where you are, and he knows what you're going through. The God of heaven knows you better than you know you. He made you. He loves you. He knows exactly where you are physically. He knows where you are emotionally. He knows where you are uh, spiritually. God knows where you are. And he came to where this man was. He encounters this man next to the pool. Jesus knew how long he had been there, 38 years and here's what he asked him, and this is profound, and it's powerful. Jesus said, do you want to be well? Now, when you read that, you would think that's one of those duh questions, right? Really? I mean, the man is at the pool. He's waiting on the stirring of the waters. Why would Jesus ask him, do you want a better life? Would you like to be well? Would you? And so when I read that, I wonder, why would Jesus ask that? So I thought through it, and I thought, well, it could have been because Jesus saw this man had developed some very unhealthy systems for survival. Jesus saw how the man had kind of gotten comfortable in being miserable. He saw that. He saw maybe the man was beginning to mail it in, and he didn't really think it would get better, so he didn't want it to get better. And so, he'd kind of, so Jesus kind of looked at him like, man, you've been here for 38 years. Maybe you don't want to change. Maybe you've given up on the idea that it can get better and it will get better. So maybe, 
Maybe you're content where you are. I don't want to mess up that if that's the situation. You see, Jesus wanted to change his life, but the man had to want him to change his life. You see, he had to will to allow Jesus to change him because Jesus, listen, was not going to force his will on this man. He wasn't going to come in there and say, bless your heart, here you are, I'm going to, I'm going to change your life, everything about it, whether you want me to or not. That's not how he works. He wanted to change the man, but he wanted the man to want to be changed. And can I tell you, God will not force his way into your life. He won't force his way into your relationship. He will not force his way into your career. He will not force his way in. He offers it, but he will not force it. And so he says to the man, will you be made whole? So I ask you this morning, will you be made whole? I mean, with where you are, do you, do you want better? Do you, do you want a better relationship? Do you, you want a more joyful life? Do you, do you want to see your life go to, well, listen, he's available, but he's asking the question, do we want it? Do we want a better life? And I love the response of the man. He goes, well, you know, Jesus, here I am at the pool. I've, I've been around. I've seen the water stirred. He's been there 38 years. I've seen the water stirred. But he said, I, I didn't have anybody listen to the shoes. I didn't have anybody to help me. Nobody would help me get to the water when the water was stirred. People jumped in ahead of me. Nobody would help me. And so here I am. And of course, I think part of the reason Jesus wrote the question, he's thinking, dude, you've been there 38 years you could have scooted an inch a day. You, just ooch a little bit toward the water, brother. I mean, I want to change your life, but you got to scoot. I mean, I want to bring about a miracle in your life, but you got to want it, and, and you've not shown me anything. You said 38 years, and your brother can't move an inch. So the point is, I, I think that's very profound in the story is sometimes we settle on these levels less than God's best, and we want to blame him when he's saying, I'm sitting here waiting on you. And so the man for 38 years had not even moved toward the water. And, and what's interesting about it is no one else around the pool moves toward Jesus. Have you ever wondered when you read that story why everybody around the pool of Bethesda wasn't healed? Why just this one man? He's Jehovah Rapha. He's the God who heals. He, he, he can heal anything. He can heal anyone. Well, why only one at the pool got... You, you, let me give you what I think. I'll give you what I think. Because when you read the story, there was only one man at the pool focused on Jesus. The rest of them were looking at the water. It's like looking at the picture when you have the person standing right here by you. Don't bother me. I got a picture. Oh, look at that picture. Look at that. Huh? They're looking at the symbol when they had the Savior. You, you know what I believe? And again, I don't think I'm going too far out on a limb to say this. I think if other people around the pool would have said, Jesus, I want in on that. <laughs> I, I want a miracle of my life. I believe you can do any. I heard about the water to wine. I heard about the boy last week. You, you brought him back to life. I want that. But don't you believe God would have done an incredible miracle around the pool of Bethesda? What's my point? My point is, sadly, there was a pathology that had developed among those people where they had meld in, they had given it up, and they had stopped even trying. And because they weren't trying, they weren't trusting. And so God, uh, uh, Matthew 13, 58, he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. He didn't do it because he didn't believe he would do it. So Jesus is challenging this one man. You want a better life? Do you want to be made whole? I'm here. I'm the Savior of the world, man. I made you. There's nothing too hard for me, but do you want this? I believe with all my heart, had the man not responded to Jesus, I think Jesus would have walked away, and I think that joker would have died on that cot. I, I think God gave him an opportunity. He, he came into his life, and he said, the choice is yours. I, I'm willing, if you're willing. And again, God doesn't impose his will on anyone. In fact, when you read 2 Peter 3, 9, he says, God is not willing. What's the will of God? He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He said, he's not willing that any, he didn't say many. He said any, but all. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. So the will of God is for every single solitary person to know Jesus. Well, why don't they, every single solitary, why don't they know Jesus? 
It's not that it's God's will that has failed. It's ours. When you read John time and time again in the Gospel of John, you'll read this phrase, Jesus saying, they will not will, here's the word, will, they will not come to me that they might have life. Jesus said, they they will not. I will, they won't. (laughs) They will not come to me that they might have life. Then you get to John 8, you know what he says? They can't come to me. They can't come to me. Here's the point. Put those two ideas together. A continual, willful rejection of Jesus can bring about an eternal, judicial rejection by Jesus. Meaning you can turn him down, turn him down, turn him down, Say, no, 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 no. I don't want it better. I don't want you. I don't want it in my life. No, sir. No. I, I know the Spirit's drawing. I feel all that. I know I need to receive. I know I need that. But no, no thanks. Not today. Maybe some other time. Genesis 5 says, my spirit will not always strive with a man, meaning you can turn him down to the point where he won't bother you anymore. Okay. <laughs> Is that what you want? It's not what I want. It's not my will. It's your will. And so it isn't long until a person's no longer bothered. What's my point? My point is there at the pool, this man had the Savior of the world ready to change his life, but the decision is his. Will you be made whole? That decision happens every time we have a service like this. Every time someone watches a service like this, there's the work of the Holy Spirit in taking God's word and the worship we've experienced and bringing it into the heart and the life of someone in different ways because I don't know how he works in everyone's life. But the Spirit of God says, this is for you. This is the word you needed. And then it's up to you. you got to act on it. You have to receive it and obey it. And notice the third thing, and you see this played out, the deliverance he received. This man didn't have much faith. He had enough faith to get him to the pool. He had enough faith to watch the water. He had enough faith to recognize Jesus when he showed up. He had a little faith. I told you last week, we all start out with a little faith. Just a little bit. We don't start out with a lot of faith. We start, in fact, Romans, I'm I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Romans 12, he said, God has dealt with every man the measure of faith. Not a measure, but the measure, meaning we all start out with the equal measure of faith. Now on in 1 Peter 3, he'll say, add to your faith, virtue and all these other things, but we start with the measure of faith. Meaning that we were born with enough faith to place our trust in Jesus. John 1, he's the light that lights everyone that comes into the world, meaning there's a knowledge of God in the heart of everyone that's born in the world. If you're true to the light God has given you, he'll give you increased light to the point you'll wreck a plane and drop a missionary on top of somebody looking for light. So we were born with a little bit of faith. This man had a little faith. And Jesus was asking him to place his faith, listen, in his word. What was his word? Here's Jesus' word to the man. Rise rise man after 38 years he there, there's no getting up 38 years he's been in the 38 years he's been on the mattress 38 years he's just mailed it in this is as good as it gonna get this is a cheap gate other people are enjoying a life but i'm at the pool of bethesda there's no joy my this is it I'm just, I'm a dead man, even though I'm still alive. There's no point and purpose of me hoping or dreaming anymore. And everybody around me is just like me. And Jesus comes into his world and says, get up. Get up. What are you doing there? I'm just giving you my word, and my word to you is get up. My word to you is rise. Rise. Can I tell you, you can have a word from God. God can speak into your life. But until you take that and act on that word, it will be powerless to you. It will not infect your life. James says, those who know to do good and do not do it, it becomes sin. It's just rebellion against God. James went on to say, faith without what? Works. It's what? Dead. It's like getting in the holy huddle on the weekends and knowing what we're to do but doing nothing with it. We don't move the ball down the field. And the word of Jesus to this man was going to change his life. But listen, the faith of this man had to be strong enough in the word that he had received from Jesus where he would try to stand. And all of a sudden, he takes Jesus at his word and he puts his faith in Jesus. And suddenly his legs are made strong. And for the first time in 38 years, this man stood. 
And Jesus said to him, take up your bed. That old system, that old dysfunction, what has been keeping you there and sustaining you there, you're not going to need that anymore. Get, get rid of that. Those things you used to lean on and those things you used to look to for your security, get rid of that. And then he said, walk. You need to get away from this place. You need to get away from these people. <laughs> You're hanging out with some people that I'm here and they don't want me. You, you need to remove yourself from these negative people. You need to get out of this dysfunction. You see, association begets assimilation. You do become like who you hang with. And so there comes a time when you hear the word of God and you realize these people are dragging me down and I'm relying on things I don't need to rely on. God's given me the power to move beyond this situation. I'm going to rise, take up my bed, and walk. And when that man exercised his faith in God's word, he experienced a miracle. So let me tell you what you do with your faith is important. I'll end where I started. It's important. You can take your faith and you can place it in a church. I wouldn't recommend that. I, I love our church. We're not a perfect church. We don't have a perfect pastor. I wouldn't place my faith. I would not place my faith in a church believing that that church can assure my eternal destiny. And I know people do because when I talk to people all the time, I say, hey, man, are you going to heaven? Well, I go to this church or that church. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Catholic. I'm a Presbyterian. You know, they throw out the brand names. I get all that, but your religion, as good as religion may be in some places, I, I'm just telling you, there's no, nothing salvific in your religion, nothing salvific in your religion. Nothing in your religion will get you to heaven. In fact, you're probably going to have to get over a lot of your religion to get there. So you, you've got religion. Then other people say, well, I, I just think it's my righteousness. I'm going to put my faith in my ability to do the right thing. Turn over a new leaf. I'm going to be a better man. I'm going to be a better woman. Uh, that's, what, that, that's, that's the plan. And, and one day, God will look down out of heaven and go, whoa, dude, you, you, you need to be up here. Yeah, you got it together. Listen, I, I can tell you this morning, there's not one of us in the room that can be good enough to get into heaven. When God gave the law as the standard of the Old Testament by which man could be measured, he gave them the standard because he knew they would never live up to the mark. They would sin, and they would need a Savior. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. What does it mean? It means all have missed the mark. In the Old Testament, you had to physically break the law to violate it. Jesus said if you think about breaking the law in the New Testament, you're guilty of the whole thing. <laughs> now, look, I, I know that in the Old Testament, you had to murder somebody. The Bible says that Jesus said if you hate them enough, kill them. You've already killed them. I, I'd rather you hate me than kill me. There is a difference, but I'm just suggesting to you that in the mind of God, in the eyes of God... If you're being held out of a fire by a chain of 10 links, how many links in the chain have to break before you fall in the fire? 10 or one? <laughs> That's why he said, look, if you think about doing wrong, you've already sinned. And who among us have not had a bad thought since we've been in here? I'm just saying, guys, your righteousness, if you take that little bit of faith and you put it in religion or you put it in your righteousness... I wouldn't trust the best five minutes I've ever lived to be good enough to get me into heaven. That's just me. You say, well, I'll put it in the rituals. Easter season's coming. I'll follow these rituals, and I'll, put them in the, I'll follow them religiously, the rituals. I'll be the best person. Listen, th there's, there's nothing you can do to merit salvation. Here it is. Jesus said, back to John 14, I am the way, not one of many, the truth, not your truth, my truth. Everybody's got a truth. There's only one truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he made it real clear. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the only way to heaven. And the man that day at the pool of Bethesda took that little bit of faith sprinkled with a lot of skepticism. He'd been there 38 years. Brother was beat down. But he took that little bit of faith he put it in Jesus. He stood up, he took up his bed, and he walked. And can I tell you, somewhere in heaven, as I'm standing before you this morning, there's a man whose life was changed at a place called Bethesda because he took a little bit of faith and he put it in God's word. So I want to tell you, this could be a starting place for some of you, a place where your life could change forever.
for you and I for all eternity to be around the throne of God enjoying all that he has for us if you just take that little faith sprinkled with your skepticism and put it in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It never returns void. It never fails. You cannot lie. And so, Lord, today we have your word, the Bible. And in your word, you said if we call upon you, you will save us. You said if we come to you, you will in no wise cast us out. So, Father, I'm challenging my friends in the room and those watching online who've never placed that little faith they have in you to humble their heart. And right where they are in this moment, they will say, Lord Jesus, I'm exercising my faith. I'm believing in you. With all that I know about me, I now trust and believe in all that I know about you. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Lord, this is the prayer that I pray, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Met Church Live. Before you go, we don't want you to miss out on opportunities to stay connected during the week. On Mondays at 7 o'clock, we have At the Ranch with Pastor Bill. On Wednesdays at 6 o'clock, we have Inside the Music with Robin Laney. And on Thursdays at 7 o'clock, we have the Met Spotlight. Friend us, follow us, and like us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And let's keep the conversation going. Have a great week.